There are some conferences where one goes and one serves, and one is grateful for the privilege. Um, and there are other conferences where, although that is true, one nevertheless comes out feeling again and again and again like a debtor, and this is one of them. So I am grateful to have been here. Now this evening, I would like to direct your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3, and I shall read the first seven verses. This is what Holy Scripture says. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. This is the word of the Lord. The pastor as father to his family and flock. You might well ask how these roles can be so tightly tied. Isn't this a wee bit artificial? But God himself makes the connection and not just in this passage that I've just read, but pretty commonly. Thus, we read, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, though you have countless guides in Christ, Paul tells these Corinthian believers, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Yes, you have learned some important lessons from Peter and from Apollos, there have been other preachers on your block. But I beg of you to remember, Paul has the temerity to say, spiritually speaking, I'm your dad. And he uses that to suggest that in some sense, therefore, they ought to be patterning themselves after him because that's the way fathers and sons worked in the ancient world, as we saw the first night. Or in Philippians 2.22, at the individual level, you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Now, genetically, of course, Timothy wasn't Paul's son. But in the ancient world, sons, as we saw last night, learned their trade, their behavior, their skill set in their vocation very normally from their dads. And Timothy has learned the ministry from Paul. He served with me as a son in the ministry, which means, of course, that Paul has served with Timothy as his father. Or 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. You know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, encouraging you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you to his kingdom and glory. In other words, Paul's approach was not simply that of the apostle, though he could appeal to his apostleship, not simply as a witness to the truth, although on occasion he does that. His appeal is as a father, exhorting and encouraging. Or this passage that we've just finished reading, 1 Timothy 3, 5. The pastor, elder, overseer, must manage his own household well 
with all dignity keeping his children submissive. It could well be read that way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? Or in the Old Testament, there is Elisha serving a kind of apprenticeship to Elijah. And when Elijah is suddenly snatched away, Elisha cries, my father, my father. Because there's been a father-son relationship of apprenticeship in the ministry itself, as it were. Or I love the small accidental things that crop up in Scripture. That wonderful passage in Nehemiah 8 and Nehemiah 9 where the people of God are called together after the wall has been built in a great Bible conference led by Ezra the scribe. Ezra trains a whole lot of Levites. The Bible, of course, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and by this time the people spoke in Aramaic. But they have a whole Bible conference breaking things down into sections with the scripture read and translated and explained by all of Ezra's helpers. We read chapter eight, verse, re- verse eight. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear, that means translating it, and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. And after this first day's conference was over, most people went home, but the fathers, The fathers and the other leaders stayed for an extra day of Bible conference. And this was now on the second day of the seventh month and the great feast day, the Feast of Tabernacles, was scheduled for the 15th. Nobody had been observing what God taught for the Feast of Tabernacles, not for centuries. And now these men were beginning to exercise leadership in their own families, in their own clans, across this small fledgling exile community. And after they had been taught the word of God for this whole additional day, then they taught their families. And in consequence, people went out and got the twigs and shrubs that were necessary to build these little booths, these little temporary shanties, to remind themselves that they had been a pilgrim people before God brought them into the promised land. And in some sense, they were still a pilgrim people to remember God's mercies. And then on the the 15th, halfway through the month, the feast started. It lasted seven days. And then on the eighth day, they followed the law yet one more step. On the eighth day, there was supposed to be a special reading of Torah, a public reading of the word of God. And that too was undertaken, all because the men of the nation had gathered together together to study God's word and exercise leadership in their families and clans. Let me tell you, we need that big time in our churches. I was brought up in French Canada. And because of the social dynamics of the time, you almost never evangelized any family by going after the children first. You didn't get them. There was just too much antipathy. It was very rare to see a woman saved on her own. Happened, but it was rare. But if you got the father, you got the father, the wife, the kids, and the pocketbook. It was a bit of a patriarchal society, but let me tell you, it was a great blessing for the gospel when the gospel did start moving in that province. You got the father, the mother, the kids, and the pocketbook. And then after years and years and years of almost nothing, in eight years, Between 1972 and 1980, our churches grew in number from about 35 to 500. And about 80% of the converts were young men. And almost all the leaders in French Canada today come out of that bunch. So after a while, you see, when I moved into English Canada and started pursuing a little more education, I heard some statistics that made no sense to me at all. I heard statistics like, far more women become Christians than men. Implication, evangelize women. Most people get converted at the age of 18 or younger. Pour your energy into children. None of that made any sense to my experience. Besides, by that time, I had done a chemistry and maths degree. It wasn't hard to see where the statistical problems were. So the, 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 the teacher who taught me 
85% or whatever the figure was of converts take place under the age of 18, I asked him, how many man hours, how many women hours, how many people hours of service do you spend in these churches for the different, different age groups? So you got your nursery and then you got your toddlers and, and th- th- then you got your preschoolers and then you got your kitty winkles and then eventually you get junior high and then you get your, your senior high. Somewhere along the line you throw in a Wana club and pioneer girls and then you have uh, your high school outings and all of that. And then you have your women's circles in those days and your women's missionary society and all that. And maybe if you were lucky the deacons met once a month. And then you ask why you're getting more converts for the younger ones. Hey, I'm a Calvinist, I know how to fix that. You go after the men. So when I became pastor of a church on the West Coast, we managed to get rid of about a third of our kitty programs and put the men that were involved in them into evangelism. And within two years, we were seeing more men than women being converted. And I'm reformed because God uses means, don't you see? These are such terrible distortions. And equally, it's a horrible distortion today when we see women coming forward and exercising leadership in the home, in Bible study, and leading the children in family devotions, and taking up, taking up responsibility in the church just for the simple reason that men don't step forward. And then we wonder why we have something that we call today the effeminization of the church. Not the women's fault. It's ours. Don't misunderstand me either. I don't want the women to sit back and do nothing. All I'm saying is I love this passage in Nehemiah 8 and 9 where the men step forward and lead the entire returned exiles into reformation and revival, national act of contrition, and then a public renewal of the covenant because the men stayed on for extra Bible teaching, made sure they knew what they were doing, and then they led the entire family of God into this next step. And thus, you see, concern for the families and concern for the public ministry of the entire covenant community suddenly becomes almost indistinguishable. You really can't have one there without the other. So what I want to do in the rest of my time tonight is list some of the obvious parallels in Scripture and in experience between being a father to the family and a father to the congregation. Not every man is the one and the other together. Not every man who is the one must be the other. But there are enough parallels that it will help us to think through these commonalities. Before embarking on this list, I remind you that we who are fathers to families and or congregations must see ourselves as sons first, sons of God, sons of fathers and mothers, sons even of congregations. Because just as we as pastors become fathers to congregations, others have pastored us. Do you know what my first impetus to the ministry was? It wasn't from my parents. My parents were far too wise to try to push me toward the ministry. Now I was finishing chemistry and mathematics at McGill and was heading off to Cornell to do a PhD in organic synthesis. And the minister of the church that I was going to in Montreal stopped me one day halfway through the winter and said, I want you to be my assistant this summer. I said, you know, there are a lot of young people in this church. You got me confused with somebody else, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing divinity. I'm not a theology student. I'm in chemistry, you know? I think you got me mixed. No, I haven't got you mixed up. I want you to be my assistant this summer. So we had a fight. I won. I, I, I didn't do it. But for the first time, I began to wonder if maybe I should at least be thinking about it and praying about it. It's, it's not that I was trying to run from the Lord at that point. I mean, I wanted to be a serious Christian. I, 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 I was a vice president of our McGill Christian Fellowship, the IVCF chapter, and, and I was involved in our church, but, 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 but I was doing chemistry. Ministry was what my dad did. Then I spent that summer working in a research lab in air pollution up in Ottawa. And up the valley, another chap and myself, we were starting a small Sunday school on the English side 
trying to bring in some parents in a poor district to see if we could begin a small church up there. And going through my mind a thousand times that summer was a little chorus, by and by when I look at his face, beautiful face, thorn-shadowed face, by and by when I look at his face, I'll wish I had given him more. I could just picture myself coming before the Almighty on the last day and saying, here's my chemistry, isn't this cool? And for some people, that's what they're called to do, in all fairness. But it didn't ring anymore. And I returned for further study and heard another minister of the gospel get up and preach a sermon on Ezekiel 22. I sought for a man to stand in the gap before me for my people, and I found none. And it was as if the whole sp the Spirit of God poured over me and said, stand up, until I could do nothing more but, s but cry in my turn, send me. I, I didn't think that stuff up. It, 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 it was not something that I was looking for. I, I, if anything, I was looking the other direction. But those two men were fathers to me. And then another one took me under his arm and began to teach me the rudiments of intercessory prayer. So before we think of ourselves as pastors, fathers to the congregation, we have to remember that we stand on other people's shoulders. We are sons first, sons of the living God, sons of our fathers and mothers, sons of pastors, fathers in the congregation before us. And now let me get to the point, the parallels. This is not in any tight order of authority, of, of, of importance, although ah, they overlap so much. I'll just leave it at that. Number one, training and teaching the whole counsel of God. Training and teaching the whole counsel of God to the whole family or to the whole people of God. We've seen the importance of teaching the counsel of God from father to son in the book of Proverbs. We've seen it implicitly on the fly in Nehemiah 8 and 9. And in fact, this whole business of reverencing God's word, making it the center part of your life, shows up in many, many surprising and frequently overlooked ways. Do you remember the wonderful passage in Deuteronomy 17? There Moses is looking forward to the time when there will be a king in Israel. There still isn't one. But when eventually there is a king in Israel, we read Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. This law either refers to Deuteronomy or to the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He is to write for himself a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and to not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants, notice that, and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. So he becomes king. What's he supposed to do? Audit the books of his predecessor? Appoint a commander-in-chief? Find a decent secretary of state? Nah. He's supposed to take out his quill pen and copy longhand the Pentateuch. That doesn't mean download it from a, hard, from a CD onto a hard drive without it passing through anybody's brain. It means write it out in such clear copy that it becomes your reading copy all the rest of your life. We've come across this theme before, haven't we? And it recurs again and again and again in Holy Scripture. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are to hide God's word in our hearts so that we do not sin against him. And that must be true in the, ho in the home and in the church. If you are a minister of the church of Jesus Christ, I'm so thankful for your service. Do you take responsibility for the biblical instruction of your family or have you delegated that to somebody else?
I wish I had always been wise in this one. We did some things right when we were bringing up our kids, some things we got wrong. I said this morning that my daughter was very verbal. I have an English wife. And that means she was brought up on nursery rhymes, endless nursery rhymes. The Brits are just famous for their nursery rhymes. And my daughter was verbal. So amongst the little books that our children had were four nursery rhyme books with a picture on the left and a nursery rhyme on the right. Each book had 25 of these nursery rhymes in them. And by the time she was just under two, she could open any one of these books, look at the picture, and then recite the nursery rhyme. That was 100 poems. It suddenly dawned on me, I was a bit thick, that if she could do it for a nursery rhyme, she could jolly well learn some scripture. So in our family devotion, she sat beside me in the high chair. That day I started with 1 Corinthians 13 and the first paragraph of 1 Corinthians 1. Next day, 1 Corinthians 13. Second paragraph of 1 Corinthians 1. Next day, 1 Corinthians 13. And the last paragraph of 1 Corinthians 1. So although I was working through 1 Corinthians, every day she got 1 Corinthians 13. After about two and a half weeks, I dropped off the last word of each clause. Though I, I looked at her, speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong <laughs> or a clanging cymbal. I mean, she just dropped them all in, pew, 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 just like that. Two weeks later, she reached over and she said, Tiffy, do it. Grabbed my Bible, stuck it on her chair, and recited 1 Corinthians 13. She made two mistakes. Mind you, my wife and I fell off our chairs when she got to the bit about when I was a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. <laughs> By the time she was three and a half, she had memorized 23 chapters of Scripture. But by then she was, you could tell, she was beginning to chafe under it. We quit. Instead, we started to Bible stories, endless Bible stories. You know how kids at a certain age want the same story about 50,000 times? I think we did all the narratives of Scripture about 50,000 times. And then as they got a little older, as they got a little older, we started adding other bits. I can remember the day my daughter, then about 11, said, when are we going to do the Proverbs? Oh, you're not, you're not ready for them. You can't understand them yet. Oh, come on. I am too ready. No, you're not. No, you're not ready. Reverse psychology worked wonders with my daughter. It never worked with my son, but with my daughter, it was terrific. So by the time she was convinced that she could do it, then we read the book of Proverbs. Only I had chosen one in advance and then asked what it meant afterwards. They didn't have a clue. So we worked at it and teased it out and made a game of it until she could figure out what one proverb meant in chapter one. The next day, we did Proverbs 2, and I picked out another one in advance, tried to figure, figure out some stories as to what it meant, you see. Because my job as pastor of the family, as pastor of the church, my job as teacher in the family and as teacher in the church, my job as father of the family and father of the church is to teach the whole counsel of God. Oh, my wife shares in all of this with me. I understand that but I don't want my kids ever to doubt, not for one moment, that reading and thinking about and teaching the Bible is for women and children only. And so likewise in the church. In Acts 20, I have not kept back from teaching you the whole counsel of God, the whole counsel of God to the whole people of God. Listen, in both domains, the fathers of the families and the fathers of the churches are mandated to teach God's word to a new generation. Number two, there is simultaneously an authority in this business. This has followed already from quite a th few things that have already been said in these last two days. We've seen the authority, for example, in, in the discipline that we find in the book of Proverbs. We find it likewise in the congregation, in passages like, obey those who have a rule over you, Hebrews 13, where the reference is to rulers in the church, not to civil rulers. There are other passages that talk about that. 
And then when we read the pastoral epistles, then again and again and again, Timothy or Titus are told, command and teach these things. There is an authoritative element. This too is part of leading. In fact, in fact, leading is not just teaching the word of God. There, there is a conceptualization. In the New Testament, you see pastor and elder and overseer are three names given for the one office. Then beyond that, there are deacons. Now that's fairly easy to demonstrate in my view, but pastor and elder and overseer are, are, are three names given for the one office. The elder calls to mind somebody who's uh, spiritually or in some ways a little more mature and who is using a title that was used in village rule in any case. And the, the, the pastor, that's simply a word that means shepherd, which has all of the overtones of rule and of care and, 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 and mercy and discernment and feeding the flock and so on. And then overseer or bishop, that has notions of rule, oversight. It, it is crucially important to teach the word of God. It, it is crucially important. But it is not for nothing that the Bible tells us that the pastor is also the elder, is also the overseer. Now that oversight is first and foremost done through the word. But, but you see, if you're teaching the word so that the sermon is not an art form to be admired, but God means, God's means of disclosing himself to people, whether in the family or in the congregation, then those who are ruling well are conceptualizing, thinking all the time ahead as to what is needed next. What's the next brick that needs to go into place? What's the next instruction that needs to be handled? What, what, what doctrines have we not covered? What practical outworkings have we not dealt with? What, what ways of applying the gospel to life have we been overlooking? Now that my children are teenagers, how should I be tweaking things to, to make them see more deeply into the word of God? Now that my congregation is at this stage with, with with mixed races, m multicultural, then how do I change to, to handle this sort of thing well and in a godly way? Do you see? That's not just saying, well, I'll do the next book. There is an element of oversight, of planning, envisaging the future, and thinking through the steps of getting from here to there. That's part of the pastor's, elder's, overseer's job. Teaching is at the heart of it. Don't misunderstand me. I don't want to turn this merely into managerial success. Yet at the same time, it's not just teaching. Occasionally you come across a pastor who just loves to sit in his study and read book after book after book and craft gorgeous sermons that can go right to the press. Church is a wonderful place. Apart from the people, they're a bit of a pain. But, but, but the sermons are really good things. They're, they're, they're sort of an art form to be admired. God help us. We don't need them in the ministry. Because at the end of the day, Christian leadership in the elder, pastor, overseer's role doesn't make the sermon an end, but a means to an end Amen. to bring glory to God and good to the people whom God has redeemed by the death of his son. And that means, that means that a certain kind of authority must be exercised. Now it's at this point that I want to remind you of one of the most important passages in the New Testament on authority. I think it is sometimes misunderstood. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and following. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, something like that. Numbers one and two after the head honcho. She's still thinking of a purely nationalistic kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? Take up my experiences and he is thinking of the cross. Can you follow me there? With remarkable ignorance and audacity, they reply, we can. You can almost see Jesus smiling. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. One of them was going to become the first apostolic martyr. The other one was going to end his life in exile on an island. Yeah, they were going to get more than they bargained for. They were going to drink from Jesus' cup all right. 
but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers, only of course because they didn't get their dibs in first. It's not because they were rebuking them for their arrogance, they just felt that they could be passed by. That's when Jesus called them together and said, now here's the point. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now I think sometimes we have heard Jesus' antithesis, I didn't come to be served but to serve. He mustn't exercise authority but become a slave. In an antithesis that is not quite right, instead of exercising authority, then we become everybody's uh, rug. Anybody in the church can tell us what to do. And if we start insisting on anything in the lines given by our brother this morning, Crawford Loritz, then, then we're charged with being insensitive or being a bully boy or being brash or throwing our weight around. And, and so we get intimidated because, because on the one hand, our culture is saying that you're supposed to be nice. And then you read a passage like this and, and then it gets interpreted in this sort of niceness motif. We don't throw our authorities around, we're nice. But whatever this text means, it can't possibly mean that. You know why? Because the archetype of this antithesis is Jesus himself. And Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth is his. He expects to be worshiped as God. It, it, Jesus really does have wonderful authority. It's not as if he's rejecting all authority and he's not telling his followers to reject all authority either. He's telling them to reject authority as it is used amongst the pagans and to use authority as he exercises it himself. What's the difference? The authorities keep using authority in such a way that regardless of what they say politically, at the end of the day, a huge component of their interest is simply to be number one. They want to rule because they like ruling. It's one of the reasons why when we do elect a leader, whether in a parliamentary system or in a Republican system, after a few years, we begin to suspect that they're becoming insensitive. They become so used to the, to, to the perquisites of power. They, 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 they enjoy having secret service open their car doors for them and everybody singing and clapping and approving them or, or, or the press dividing around them, but nevertheless being important in the limelight. And so after a, once, after a few years, we want to turf the blighters out now and then and get in a fresh lot, don't we? Except we know that in a few years' time after that, they're going to become the same sort of a person, aren't they? It's, it's very, very rare to find someone who's put into a high position where it does not finally go to their head. And suddenly, protecting their position is a big part of their mission. They, they never put it quite like that, but you can see it. It's in all the signs, isn't it? But what about Jesus? He doesn't view his genuine authority with God as something to be seized and hung on to, Paul writes to the Philippians. He doesn't have to protect it, it's already his. And he says he doesn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. His authority is exercised in such spectacular self-giving for the sake of others that all of the authority that he musters is bound up not only with his identity as the eternal son, not only with his identity as the God-man, 
Not only with his identity as the one whom the Father has insisted should be honored as all honor the Father himself, but it is bound up with that damnable cross. It is bound up with a cry of desolation. It is bound up with bearing my sin in his own body on the tree. And none can doubt, not even for a second, that he exercises all of his authority for the good of others. Certainly not to protect his perks. Do you not know that even now I could call 12 legions of angels? And in the same way Jesus says that those who exercise authority amongst his people must exercise authority in the same way. That is, with self-sacrifice, self-death, self-denial, transparently for the good of others. As soon as people in our churches or in our families start suspecting that we're throwing our weight around simply so that we can pat ourselves on the shoulders and be number one, we lose everything. But apart from churches that are made up of just remarkably mean, unconverted people, where a minister transparently is giving himself transparently for the sake of others, for their good, it's remarkable how much authority he actually begins to accrue to himself. So there is an authority to be exercised in the church of the living God as fathers and in our families as fathers. But this is tied likewise then as a further extrapolation from this passage, Matthew chapter 20, to loving compassion that must be exercised in both places, in the home and in the congregation. It's bound up with that text that I read briefly this morning, not exasperating your children. There is a kind of exercise of discipline that is merely scoring points, even in the family, isn't there? But if a father is exercising his authority out of genuine love for the sake of the son, the good of the son, being careful, trying with all his might not to take actions and to say things that merely exasperate and frustrate and alienate the son, then it becomes an exercise of authority and love, doesn't it? In the church, this is seen often enough, isn't it? Here we find 1 Timothy 5. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Or again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 22 and following. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him he must gently instruct in the hope that God will lead them to repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. I read through my dad's journals. He kept them sporadically. He didn't keep them all his life. But although there were many moving passages in them, amongst the most moving was on one occasion when I was out of school and in hospital. I was out of school for most of an academic year. I was 10 or 11 and uh, the doctors didn't know what to do. It turned out I could have died. Then I was weeks and weeks and weeks in pain in hospital and in bed. My dad's journals during that time are unbelievable. spent my prayer time weeping for dawn. Last night I went to bed without giving him a word of encouragement. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me.
And you see, that's what our relationship with the church should be too, shouldn't it? Training and teaching, authority, loving, compassion. Number four, discipline, discipline. Not because discipline is something other than training and teaching and other than love and compassion. Discipline must be exercised in love and compassion. In fact, isn't that something that we already saw in the family in the book of Proverbs? It's the man who hates his son that doesn't exercise discipline because exercising discipline in a, in a good and godly way takes reserves of energy, of strength, of determination, of, of care, of self-examination, trying to get it right rather than simply ignoring a problem and hoping it will go away. But the same is true in the church of the living God too, isn't it? Of course, discipline is more than turfing blighters out. It's admonishing, encouraging, rebuking, training in righteousness, sometimes taking a person aside, trying to win them over to something, a better way, gently admonishing them, and sometimes flat out confuting them. And in three general categories in the New Testament, there is a place for the most severe sanction, not to be undertaken easily or quickly or lightly, but it is there in three categories of sin. Excommunication, people being cut off from the assembly of God's covenant community. Those three categories are major doctrinal sin major doctrinal sin, especially amongst those who are trying to promote it as opposed to some brand new Christian who still hasn't figured out which end is up. Number two, major moral defection, as for example in 1 Corinthians 5 with a man sleeping with his stepmother who will not quit. Number three, major persistent, loveless, schismatic attitude, warn a divisive person once and then twice, Paul says, and then have nothing to do with them. And those things do have to be addressed, not only for the sake of the entire church, knowing, as Paul says, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We would say a rotten apple spoils the whole barrel. But also for the sake of the individual, in the hope that he will be saved on the last day. That's what the text says. And so we read such texts as the one we find at the end of Galatians. Galatians 6, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. That is, you're carrying this person's burden as you try to restore the errant sinner and thus you are following the teaching of God in Christ Jesus. If instead someone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he's kidding himself. Oh, I'm not like them, you understand. <laughs> they got in a lot of trouble, but it was their own fault. They didn't take any of the precautions. No, 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 no. If that's what you think, each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself. That is, you don't compare yourself with broken people. It's always easy to find somebody who's dirtier than you are. It's always easier to find someone who is less faithful than you are, and then you just end up promoting yourself. Do you, do you see? No, you examine yourself before God. Then you carry your own burden in that sense without comparing yourself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. I'm old enough now that I've lived through several really miserable, really horrible church discipline situations, people in the ministry. I won't even tell you one or two of the ugliest. But I've just come through, I don't wanna call it a delightful one. I, I just come through a wretched one with a delightful ending. Doesn't happen all the time, let me tell you. This chap began by stealing sermons, parading them as, as his own. That, 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 that is not only stealing, it indicates that the person has already abandoned what the ministry is about. 
what the ministry is about is, is to free up some person, a pastor, so, so that he is studying and thinking the word of God to enable him to teach the whole counsel of God to others. And if instead he is merely an organic tape recorder, he's taking money under false pretenses, quite apart from the stealing. And then on the church computer, one of the church computers, he started gambling. It became addictive. He was a lawyer before he was a minister, so he knew how to set up dummy corporations. And pretty soon, he had stolen $50,000 of the church's poor fund to finance his gambling addiction. And then a further 20000 from two women in the church, one of them a widow. and other things as well. Eventually, he refinanced his house and lost the money on that, and then it all blew up in his face. He was broken. He was on the edge of being suicidal. What he had done was not only immoral and unbiblical, it was illegal. Eventually, he went to jail over it. But I have to tell you that those around him put him into a program that the Free Church has set up to try to restore people like that, not to ministry, but to communion with God and with the saints, to genuine fellowship in the gospel. He and his wife hung out together, restored their marriage. He's paid off his debts, lost his house, lost his law license, lost his ministry license. He's got a low-paying job that he's working at hard, to be faithful and learning, learning, learning to be faithful in small matters, accountable before God. For a long time, he was only given five bucks a week in his pocket. His wife took over all the finances. He couldn't trust him with money. He wasn't allowed to get on any computer, not any computer, unless it was in an open place where other people could watch him because we couldn't trust him with computers. And that's just the negative part of discipline. That's just the no but eventually his love for the Lord was so restored and his enthusiasm for holiness and his shame and contrition and bitterness at all his old sin, he went around to everyone apologizing. When it came to the actual court case, his lawyers say, no, 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 you plead not guilty and then see where it goes from there. He says, I can't do that, I am guilty. I've heard a lot of people who get caught say things like, yeah, yeah, it was my fault. But you know, there were extenuating circumstances. I don't hear any extenuating circumstances from him. That's now one of the reasons why I know there's repentance. And two Sunday nights ago, we had a restoration service in the church. Not a restoration to ministry. That, ministry and leadership, that's another issue. There, there are qualifications that are laid down, including above reproach, with a good reputation with outsiders. He's lost that. But the discipline has been removed. He's a brother in good standing because at the end of the day, you who are spiritual are supposed to restore such a one who has fallen, remembering your own self, lest you also be tempted. This is a community of redeemed people, isn't it? Of forgiven people. Discipline, discipline. Discipline, to preserve the integrity of the church, to preserve the faithfulness of the church, to preserve the purity of the church, to preserve the lordship of Christ in the church, and to do good, if it is humanly possible, to those who are under discipline themselves. And that is true likewise in the home, as long as the children are in the home. I, I don't worry too much about a minister whose 15-year-old son comes off the tracks and starts doing drugs provided I see that the minister is handling it wisely and well and powerfully and shrewdly with discipline and authority and compassion and firmness, what bothers me is if he doesn't do anything, then he doesn't have any right to be in the ministry because he's not doing anything in the home. That's what 1 Timothy 3 says. If he doesn't know how to rule his own house properly, then he doesn't have any right to rule in the church. Do you see? The two are tied together. Number five. Inevitably, these matters, teaching, discipline, the way love is expressed, they're all shaped differently for different ages of our kids, different maturity of the congregation. 
you know what my first memory is as I stretch back? The very first memory I can think, I mean, they're, they're so far back, it, yeah, I'm not even sure which one is first and second anymore. Well, well, a very, very early memory is sitting in the bathtub getting done by my dad. Dad was a sort of plotter. He wasn't quick. My mother was quick. She was efficient. Efficient as she spoke, efficient as she thought, efficient around the house. My father was a careful plotter. And when he gave us baths, he was a faithful plotter there, too. Took a long time. Partly because he always told us Bible stories. So he'd start off, you know, and, and he'd begin at a book, and then he'd give us a bath and we'd get a Bible story. And then the next week, next day, whatever day, we were getting a bath from him, then uh, you got a quick review from the last one, and then you got a few, a bit more of the Bible story, all carefully acted out, and it was great fun. Let me tell you, some Bible stories are very effective in the bath. <laughs> Naaman, for example, is a great one in the bath. I remember Naaman. But you know, by the time I was 15, that wasn't the way my dad was gonna teach me Bible stories. <laughs> and likewise in the congregation, you get brand new baby Christians who are, it's, it's all marvelous, but they're just incredibly naive and don't know anything about anything. You don't give them Hodge on Romans. Maybe somewhere down the road, but not, not the first week. What this suggests, therefore, is that we need flexibility. As we grew older, then there were fewer spankings, fewer being bawled out, more encouragement, and quiet words of discernment. Like John Piper, I started being afflicted with the poetry bug. And in one of my early sessions of this poetry disease. I was writing poems all over the place, often funny ones, often nature ones. I published them in the school paper. And this particular day, I was, I don't know, 13, 14. I was outside weeding in the garden with my father. And as I was reading, I stumbled across the odd earthworm, you know? And I thought, it would be really quite cute to write a poem from the point of view of a worm. You, you probably never were afflicted with a mind like that, but I was. So I, I wrote the poem as I was reading, as I was weeding, I, I wrote the poem in my head. You know, I, it was just eight or 10 or 12 lines, I don't remember now, about how this worm, you know, came up in the, 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 the warm dirt and looked up and turned to the warmth of the sun and this bright spring day and, and squeezed away the particles of dirt and smelt the freshness of the dew and all, all of that. And then the last two lines were, I saw a spade glint in the sun. Woe is me, I am undone. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious myself. So I promptly recited all 12 lines or whatever it was to my dad. My dad kept on weeding, didn't say anything. Usually he was a big supporter of my poetry, however awful it was. Didn't say anything. And then he said, without even looking up, Don, are you sure you want to put the words of the prophet Isaiah when he sees a holy God onto the non-existent mouth of a worm? Then he kept on weeding. I said, Dad, it's only a joke, for goodness sake. But I never published it. Now, if he had descended on me, as he might well have done for some minor infraction when I was four, I probably would have published it out of sheer cussedness. But he was adapting his way of teaching, you see, as we grew older and changed ourselves. And that's true in the church, isn't it? You who are pastors of the church, one of the first things you get hold of when you get into a church is the bookstall. You don't trust that to anybody, not anybody, unless you personally vetted them. Not some sweet little old librarian 
who knows how to make cards or sort things out on a computer list, but has no discernment whatsoever and stacks the library with things like 16 ways to be happy though married. You don't want that in your bookstall. In a Christian church bookstall, you want books that edify the saints for different levels so that when there are people who are getting converted and beginning to ask first questions, you say, oh yeah, we got a section over here just for you. Do you see? You vet that, you control it. Until you've got somebody whom you've trained who will then do it for you because that's part of pastoral leadership. That's part of teaching and being prepared to handle all the different kinds of things that take place in the local church. You don't delegate that one out until you have real confidence. Likewise, in steps of maturity, small groups can be handled so that they are positioned under eldership rule, under the rule of pastors, so that they meet different needs at different levels of maturity. In one church I know, they began a reading club. It was an upper middle class church. It was a church full of readers in any case. They started a reading club. And the idea was you read one book a month that was assigned by one of the pastors. You read one book a month in this club. And this, the, these books might have been um, a, a devotional piece, a, a commentary a, a piece, some, some systematic theology, some social science uh, to, to understand what's going on, a, a, a piece of poetry, a, re a really good piece of literature, and then you would come together at the end of the month and discuss it. After two groups had gone through this for a whole year, they started a second level and then started the first level being done again, led by somebody else. Within a few years, they had four levels. In level three, they read somewhere along the line two volumes, two parts of Calvin's Institutes. In year four, the remaining two parts of Calvin's Institutes. And after a few years, you couldn't be an elder in that church unless you'd gone through three years of the, of, of the reading program. Do you, do you hear what's going on here? There's a ratcheting up of the entire theological conversation. Now, I know you can't do that in every blue collar church. I understand that. And there's some people who are never gonna join in any case. But if you're thinking about building up the whole people of God with the whole counsel of God, you ought to be thinking of ways in which you can elevate the expectations right across the board of the entire church, do you see? Well, much more quickly. Number six, some kids and churches are just plain mean. They're just terribly tough. Some kids grow up in Christian homes and they're just awful. And for a long period of time, maybe for years and years and years, they cause their parents unimaginable heartbreak, and some churches do that too. God have mercy on your soul. Just endure. I wish I could say more about that, but I'll pass. Likewise, number seven, both in the home and in the church, you persevere. Family devotions is not a one-shot deal. Discipline in the home is not a one-shot deal. Care in the church is not a one-shot deal. Things come back again and again and again and again and again. You persevere in the home and in ministry. Number eight, I will spend a bit more on this one. Be a mentor. You're not just teaching propositions. You're, you're to be a mentor. Dad taught us by how he played games. He was never, ever a poor loser. He laughed at himself more than any person I have ever seen. If he did something or said something stupid, he laughed at himself. That teaches us to laugh at ourselves. I have an assistant at Trinity called Michael Tate. He used to be associated um, with Bethlehem. He's grown a great deal in the last few years, and he is one of my part-time assistants. He does a lot of secretarial work for me. When I decided I'd put this book together for Dad, I got him to transcribe my father's handwriting, hundreds of pages, onto a computer just so that it was a little easier to manipulate. He only had to do about half of it because my father wrote about half of it in French. At the beginning, it was almost all English with a little bit of French. In the middle, it was about half and half, and by the end, it was almost all French. But Michael did all of the English bits. And after he sent me the last file, by email, he said, when I came to Trinity, my desire was to be a missionary in the hardest part of the world. Now after reading your dad's journals, I have a higher calling. 
to be faithful. Perseverance, faithfulness, and then mentoring. Mentoring, mentoring. In his later years, when he couldn't do quite so much, partly because he was looking so much after mom, he and another man began what came to be called la pastorale. I don't know how you translate that. The pastors, it's, except it's more abstract in French. So all the French-speaking pastors in the Outaouais region where they, they lived came early Monday mornings and spent somewhere between four and seven hours working over various challenges in the church, praying through the concerns of the church, and he was really giving them a kind of in-house theological education. Oh, these were young pastors. Most of them converted fairly recently, still working on their theological education. This was in the light of the fact that the church had grown so fast we didn't have a lot of mature leaders. La pastoral. Today, when I go back to that region, all the pastors come up to me. They don't talk, first of all, about Dad's preaching. Dad was a faithful expositor, but he wasn't brilliant at it. He never wrote a book. He never spoke at a national conference. Most of his life he spoke to vast crowds of 30. Only toward the end were the crowds becoming 100 and 200 and the like. What they speak to me about, without exception, every time, is the quality of his life, especially in La Pastoral. He showed them how to care. He showed them how to think. He showed them how to pray. He modeled how gospel works out in life and in pastoral leadership and thought and valuation. It was such a simple thing and so utterly profound. And I tell you, this is bound up with the Word of God in powerful ways. Do you recall that remarkable passage in 2 Timothy 3 and 4? Paul describes what will take place in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money and so forth. He describes the treacherous people as those who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women. This is not because all women are weak-willed, but if you get unprincipled power brokers with weak-willed women, the combination is dynamite. Usually when a minister in the church of God goes astray sexually, it's not just a sexual problem. There's also a control problem. And it's a combining of sins on both sides and neuroses and insecurities on both sides until there's a conflagration that blows everything up. It's just awful. And then, after describing all of this mess, Paul says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Do you see what Paul is saying in context? He's saying, choose your mentors and choose them well. Do you want to follow those characters or do you want to follow me? We're not used to thinking in those terms, but doesn't Paul say elsewhere? Be imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's what he's saying here, too. Do you really want to follow these dudes? Look at me, Timothy. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my persecutions and sufferings, and how the Lord has, 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 has come to me and rescued me again and again. Choose your mentors and choose them well. I have told a story in this respect before. If you've heard it, forgive me. But it was very powerful to me at the time. When I was an undergraduate at McGill University, another chap and I began a Bible study, an evangelistic Bible study. We didn't want too many to come, so we didn't ask too many. But eventually, by week five, we had 16 people in that room and only two of us were Christians, and I was way over my head. I didn't have a clue how to answer most of the questions that were coming up. But there was a chap on campus called Dave Ward, a graduate student, who was a rough gem. He, he was a slam, bang, uncouth, throw your energy around sort of chap who was genuinely converted and was really interested in apologetics and, and, and how to help younger guys. He was a master student, but when we got stuck, we took people to Dave Ward. I had two guys that I didn't have a clue how to answer. So I, I brought them down to Dave Ward, and he, with all of his energy, slammed around. Well, why don't you sit over there? I'll make some coffee. Bang, poured it. He was just a sloppy, big guy. What could I say, you know? And then he turned to the first one. Why did you come? 
tact was not his strong point. <laughs> the first one said, well, you know, now no, no, I'm in university, it seems like a good time to ask questions about religions. So, so I want to study some Buddhism, I want to study some Taoism, I want to study a bit of Islam, some Shintoism, and this Bible study started, and I thought maybe I'd come along to that, so I'd like to find a little bit more. Dave looked at him. Sorry, I don't have time. The guy said, I beg your pardon? He said, I don't have time. I'm a graduate student. I don't have time. You're just a dilettante. You want to sit around and talk. I don't have time to sit around and talk. You know, I'll give you some books. You want to find out about them? I'll tell you about them. I'll give you some books, and then when you've got some serious questions, you come back and see me. I don't have time. He turned to the next guy. What did you come for? I, I told you he was a rough dude, you know? <laughs> the second one said, I come from a family that I think you people call liberal. We don't believe in stuff like the resurrection and supernatural and virgin birth. and We, we, I mean, we just don't believe in that. We're a good family. We go to the United Church. We're, we're, we're tight. My mom and dad love each other. My sister and I love each other. We're a good family. We do good in the community. What on earth do you people think you have that we don't have? And Dave looked at him, looked at him, and then he said, watch me. And the student said, what do you mean? Watch me. I got an extra bed. You can come and live with me. Three months till the end of term. I'll pay for your food. You get up when I get up. You go where I go. Go to your classes when you have to. Then you watch me. And at the end of three months, you tell me there's no difference. The student, whose name was also Dave, didn't take him up on it literally, but went back again and again and again, and he was converted. Today, he's a medical missionary. Watch me. There is a huge place for mentoring in the church of God. That means that some of you who are older ought to be looking for young men in the congregation and saying, look, I want to train you how to pray. I want to teach you how to have family devotions. Now, I know you've never done this before, but I want you to join my Bible study and learn how to read the Bible. And some of you guys who are younger, you've come out of homes that have not been too stable and you're not sure which end is up, you ought to be looking around in your churches for people who have been tried just a bit. Maybe they've come through cancer. Maybe, maybe they've, they, they've been through some serious experiences in their lives and they've been walking with God for about 40 years. And you ought to be saying, teach me. Because there must be mentoring ongoing in the church of the living God. You see, in the family, and in the broader community. That's what fathers do. Two more, I'll say them very quickly. You want your children in the church and in the family to grow to become strong and independent. You don't want them to become merely dependent upon you. There's some pastors like that. There's some pastors who will never, ever give anybody an opportunity to test their wings and do anything because the pastor does it. And such pastors never become churches of more than 200 people because eventually they, they, they've run out of energy and time. Part of multiplication, besides wisdom and helping people grow to maturity, is starting a small group Bible study that will go over a whole weekend with only seven guys. Two months later, do it again with a new seven guys, only you take one of the seven guys from the first one, and he comes in as your assistant on the second one. On the third one, you get him to teach it, and you're his assistant. On the fourth one, he runs it by himself and chooses another assistant while you're doing something else. You're thinking big, but you're starting small, and you're training people to take over as much as they possibly can until you begin to see exponential growth, do you see? Because you want them to be strong. I look at the PhD students coming out of Trinity today, and the best of them, let me tell you, they stand way taller than I stood when I finished my PhD. Way taller, because it takes time to build up a reservoir and a heritage of confessional evangelical scholarship. And likewise in the ministry of the church, do you see? Our job is not to feel jealous when somebody starts questioning our theological judgment, but to keep training and teaching the people of God and giving them opportunities to teach and speak and witness to others and lead others, testing them, pushing them, encouraging them again and again and again and again so that the whole ship, as it were, is raised. I don't want my kids to be dependent on me at this stage. I still want to have influence in their lives. God knows I pray for them. But likewise, in the church of the living God, although there will always be some very weak people who always depend on others, yet 
The aim, surely, is to build maturity Amen. in the family and in the church. And finally, for all of this, you have to spend time with people. For all of this to happen, you have to enter into their world. You can't do it merely from a distance. You have to spend time talking with people, listening to people, taking people out for lunch. And what that looks like is, is different at different stages in the family and sometimes it's different in different churches. My wife, bless her heart, decided very early on that so help us God, where it was humanly possible, dinner time would be sacrosanct. That was family time. If it was humanly possible, we moved the dinner time around to accommodate the violin lesson or the flute lesson or the dance class or the, well, whatever it was that the kids were having or that I was doing, but we ate together if it was humanly possible at the dining room table with silverware and candles and we wouldn't rush. And then family devotions were at the end of that. And we turned that into a gab fest, what's going on in your day, talk, jokes, what they're reading, anything. It became the family social time for us. And we discovered that before the kids were out of high school, they didn't resent that time. They fought like anything to be there for family time themselves because that, 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 that's when we were family. That, that, that's when we, we did things together, did, did you see? And then it always ended with our family devotion time. And I learned that from my parents. Of course, there are other things you do as time goes on, you know? The kids go into this activity or that activity and off you go to games or, for, for my daughter was endless concerts and symphonies and bands and orchestras as her flute performance went up and up and up and got a music degree and then, then she was in one more thing after another. Yes, yes, yes. My son was different. He announced one day when he was uh, 18, I'm going to get a motorcycle. My wife said, no way. And he smiled sweetly and said, Dad, didn't you ride them when you were my age? <laughs> so we negotiated and uh, provided he took an MSF course, Motorcycle Safety Foundation course, and wore all the equipment and so on, you know, then, then yes. And so he, he, he got his motorcycle rode carefully. But a year later, he came and put his arm around my shoulder. He said, Dad, you know it would be really cool if you rode with me. So he got two motorcycles. It's hard being a dad, isn't it? <laughs> I still ride. In any good weather, I ride my motorcycle into Trinity. What can I say? I have to do this for my son's sake. Now he's in the Marines. Well, and he started, somewhere along the line, picked up bow hunting, so I learned to handle a bow properly. And somewhere along the line, of course, he was in the Marines and said, Dad, you know, I'm going to show you how to shoot a pistol properly. So he comes home, you know, takes me out to a pistol range. He has his own 45 Smith & Wesson XD, made in the Czech Republic. Wonderful little automatic. He's all right, I'm going to shoot you, teach you how to shoot. Puts those targets out there and he just, he just ping, ping. those Marines know how to shoot, you know. I was all over the place. No, he says, Dad, now I'm going to show you. You carry the weight in this hand. You know, you lean forward a bit more. No, don't close your eye. You leave it, squeeze the trigger. No, your thumb's a little lower. That's better. Okay. No, no, you're anticipating the shot. He's teaching me step by step, step. After I fired about 300 rounds, I'm actually grouping them. It's, it's quite marvelous. And the next time he comes home, we do it again, 300 more rounds. I'm all over the map, and he teaches me again. And gradually, gradually, my groupings are coming in. And then we go to Culver's Restaurant on the way home. And then I can ask him about how he's doing with his soul. Otherwise, I can't. He's such a private dude. <sighs> Isn't that what goes on likewise in the Church of the Living God? You try to find out where people are. It takes time, care. And sometimes these things come together. I read a lovely blog a week ago from 10th Pres, Phil Riken in Philadelphia. I learned something that I didn't know they had. 
They have a father-son reading club. I don't know how it works. I just noted it. A father-son reading club where fathers and sons read the same book and then come together with other fathers and sons to discuss the book. And the book that they had been reading this month, Phil had liked so much because he was reading with his son that he put it on his blog. It was Out of the Black Shadows, the biography of Stephen Lungu, abandoned by parents at a young age, joined a violent street gang in Rhodesia as it then was before it became Zimbabwe, was eventually wonderfully converted and is now the international director of African Ander Enterprise. Isn't that a great book to read with your son or your dad? Rise up, O men of God. Have done with lesser things. Use heart and strength and mind and soul to serve the King of Kings. I'm sure there are some of you for whom all of this is still very strange. But if you know the Spirit of God has been tugging at your own heart I beg of you, where you sit right now, lift your own heart heavenward and cry, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I want to be a son of the living God. I want to call you my father. Will you do that? And I'm sure that there are some fathers and sons here who are barely on speaking terms with their own fathers, with your own fathers and sons, whether they're here or not. Before you go to bed, phone them. Do you not hear what our Heavenly Father says at the end of the Lord's Prayer? Our Heavenly Father says, that he will not forgive us if we do not forgive others. Jesus himself teaches, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Run short accounts. Don't nurture bitterness. We have, been, we have been forgiven far more than we can ever have to forgive. And for those of you who are still of an age where your sons are part of your charge, resolve in you before the Lord to be a father to them, to be a pastor in all the ways that the Bible mandates. For those of you who are sons still under your father's jurisdiction, honor your father and your mother and obey them. And for all of us, ought we not to honor our parents and above all to come to our heavenly father and thank him for his watchful care over us in giving his own infinitely dear eternal son on our behalf, Amen. which is the beginning of worship, the beginning of life, the beginning of joy, the beginning of entrance into the community of the family of God, both for this life and for the life to come. Because otherwise, quite frankly, these two days have been a waste of time. But if they are to bear fruit in our lives, both for now and for eternity, God in his mercy, grant repentance and faith and contrition and holy joy and obedience and heartfelt adoration of our Heavenly Father. With all of this truth spilling out into our relationships with our own fathers and sons, world without end, let us pray. Forbid, Lord God, that we should be hearers of the word, but not doers of it. Grace is such a wonderful thing. Forbid that we should admire it as a proposition and walk away, but so revel in it and wash in it that we find ourselves unable to do other than to forgive and to love and to grow, to build one another up in our most holy faith with right relationships with our fathers and sons, in our families, in our churches, 
and this because you, the Heavenly Father, in the fullness of time sent your Son. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen.